Hello everyone, welcome to Purpose YouTube. My name is Dusty Small and I'm the lead pastor here at Purpose Church. As many of you know, Purpose Church is a brand new church located right in the heart of Bossier City, Louisiana. We're so glad you're here to watch today's message. Before we get started, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know your name and where you're watching from. Let me know what you're believing God for right now in your life and how I can pray for you. And one last thing, as God begins to speak to you through this message, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know what God's speaking to you about. I love to go back and see how God's moving in your life. We hope today's message will encourage you and your family. Okay, well, how many, how many got your Bibles with you? You got a phone, electronic device, get that thing powered on, just silence it, right? So we get your Bibles out. If you don't have your Bible with you, I encourage you. Be a person that gets you a Bible so you can take notes. I love looking in my Bible and, and the notes that I wrote in there when God was speaking to me. Highlight stuff, circle stuff, because the Word is my life. I have to have God's Word. Uh, or I tell you what, I know where I would be without the Word. But if you don't have it, you don't have it on your phone, we're going to have a backup version right there this morning. So I want you to just get your Bibles out. Turn with me to, to Matthew chapter 13 and then hold your place. Matthew is the first book of the Bible in the New Testament. You got Malachi, then you got silence for 400 years. And then we got the book of Matthew, right, that, enter, that enters into this new era of, of ministry. And what we're talking about is we're in a series called the Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Can you say that with me this morning? The kingdom of God. You know, everything about Jesus' earthly ministry was the ushering in of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the central figure in the kingdom of God. It's so, so important that we understand kingdom theology. And it's different than the nation that we live in when we see things with our physical eyes. We are familiar with a democracy, and God's kingdom is not a democracy, right? He doesn't have elected officials that are ruling over things. Now, he does have appointed people who are overseers, and we would call them under shepherds to the great shepherd, right? The good shepherd, as we, we see in John chapter 10 that way. But this series is really all about living a life that is countercultural. It's a living a life of being all in with God. It's understanding a life that isn't an earthly focused life. Jesus established a new kingdom that was a spiritual kingdom that would impact the natural. That it would impact the life that we live here on this earth. But the kingdom that he was establishing, which blew the minds of all those around him, would be something different than a king sitting on a visible throne. But the king is sitting on a spiritual throne on the hearts of those who want him to be there. Jesus doesn't force himself on anyone. But he is, in a sense, that perfect gentleman that is providing the provisions necessary for you and I to be in relationship with him. Now, I want to set up our text this morning and remind you that we finished a series titled, Who is Jesus? If you're new and you want to go back to our YouTube channel, go find Purpose Church. Look for our logo there on YouTube. You can watch those series on who Jesus was. And we finished that series with Jesus being the King of Kings. So we ended one series with Jesus being that supreme authority, that King that is above all kings, that King that is superior to all kings. And it ushered in the series, The Kingdom of God. And last week we started the series preaching a message titled Kingdom Flavor, that you and I are the flavor in God's kingdom. Can I pause and just brag on the church for just a little bit? Our YouTube channel is exploding. Like, with, I mean, last, the last several messages, like, have, the last one had 1,400 views. Like, literally, we've just seen God's word. People are hungry for the word of God. People aren't looking for something that's just going to tickle their toes. Sometimes it might step on your toes, right? But people really want to know what the Word of God is. And so I preached a message titled the salt and, on the salt and light. But Jesus is telling us, you are the flavor of God's kingdom. People are going to want to come back or be pushed away, depending upon that flavor. So that message is up if you want to go back and get caught up there. So let's, let's think about it. So here Jesus is in Matthew chapter 13. 
He started his public ministry at about 30 years-ish old, 33 years old, around, around this, this time frame. And he's, he's looking at all of this that's, that's going on. And he's bouncing from place to place. He's just preached the Sermon on the Mount. He's looking for places that are very conducive to sharing the Word. Now, they didn't have amplified systems back in the day. So Jesus would preach on the side of a mountain where his voice could travel. He would stand on the edge of a shoreline and he would preach. Sometimes he would be standing on a boat. But he would travel the countryside in a sense, sharing about the kingdom of God. And as he would do this, it started out with small crowds following him and then large crowds following him. And they were intrigued by his message. Because as he began to speak and as he began to perform miracles, their minds reverted back to the idea of a a, a Messiah was coming. There was one coming that would free them from the oppression of the Roman rule. Someone that would be in the line of David from the tribe of Judah. And he would be this conquering king. He would be a supreme political leader. He would lead with kindness. He would unite the people. He would restore peace. This Messiah reminded them of King David and how life in Israel was when David was king. And the message, the kingdom of God. The whole message that Jesus had was all about the kingdom of God. What was so interesting about this message is that it was countercultural. It was countercultural to the day, and it was counter to their thinking. See, they had an idea of what this Messiah would do. But Jesus is teaching them and helping them understand that what they thought versus what is, is really like an upside down picture of everything. Right? They they were envisioning it to look like this, but Jesus is flipping the script and he's painting a new picture of what it's going to be like. Right? What what did he say? You have heard that it was said to those of old, but I say to you, right? If you commit adultery, that was bad, right? But I say to you, even if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery, right? What does he say? You heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But now I give you a new instruction. He goes, if you, if you even call, get angry toward someone, you were in danger of judgment, hatred. Call somebody an idiot, right? This language that we see. And now he's flipping the script and changing their understanding. Message by message, parable by parable. And so that's why a series on the kingdom of God is so, so important. Because what you were thinking and expecting is not why I'm here. It's not why I'm here. And so in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 46, I've titled this morning's message, Priceless. Can you say that with me? Priceless. Do you have anything in your life that might be priceless? Do you have anything that was passed down in your family that's priceless? Something that maybe somebody gave you that, it, now it might not have a large monetary value on it, but you ain't ever given this thing up, right? I mean, I've got, I love to collect sports cards, basketball cards, and baseball cards, but I've got some that, that are worth more than others, and then I've got some that might not be worth as much as another one's worth, but it holds some sentimental value to me. It's not for sale, right? It, it's priceless to me. You could offer me a certain amount of money, and I'm not going to sell you this particular thing. It's priceless. Well, these parables that I'm about to read to you are twin parables. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. Now, they're not identical twins, but they are fraternal twins in nature. Can I read it to you? Matthew chapter 13, verse 4 through 46 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. and his excitement, he hid it again. And he sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. Notice the similarities between these two parables, right? One, we have this this man who finds a treasure. The other one, we have this person who's out looking for a treasure. And so this morning's message, priceless, 
is all about what is that priceless thing. What I hope you get out of this this morning is that you would be willing to be all in for Jesus. That if you find this treasure this morning, you would be willing to sell everything that you have to go and get this one thing. Now, I'm always trying to flip something. My little side hustle business, I'm always looking to to buy this card, thinking about how I'm going to sell it for this much, and then I want to, boom, bounce it up to this one. And so my card that I PC, my personal collection, is Derek Jeter. I'm a Yankees baseball fan. I, I like Derek Jeter, uh, and so I collect his card. But then there's one that's kind of out of the box for me. It's not, I, not, a, not really my favorite team, but there's one player, because of the monetary value, you might say, that I try to up the ante with this particular card. And that's the 1986 Fleer Michael Jordan rookie card. I know nobody in here has ever heard of Michael Jordan, but he's an up-and-coming player. They say he's going to be good. He might make the all-star team. I don't know. But anyways, this is the guy that if I can continue to, to sell this, I'll sell that. And guaranteed, if I find this one treasure, I'm selling it all to get this one. That's what I want for you this morning. You with me? All in, ready to sell it all if you can get this one thing, okay? Now, Holy Spirit, help me get everybody to know that that one thing is Jesus, okay? I'm not going to reveal it until the end, but just hopefully they know it's Jesus. Come on, you with me this morning? So this little theme here, what's going on here? He, he buried the treasure. Right, there's this man, he's just out and about, and all of a sudden, he comes across this treasure, and he finds it, and he is, whoa, what did I come across? It's like the, the most valuable treasure that they say has ever been found is the San Jose treasure. It was a buried treasure worth like $17 billion. Billion, that's a lot of zeros, right? Billion, right? So this man who just happened to come across this particular treasure. The idea when we read in the Bible of something being buried, it was because it was valuable. Anything that would have been buried back in the day was valuable. And, and we call it A-N-E, ancient Near Eastern culture. In that particular culture, remember, they didn't have safety deposit boxes. They didn't have banks. They didn't have safes. They didn't have ways to go store things that were valuable. If something was valuable, they buried it. And anything that meant something to someone would have been buried that way. And then you add into all of the wars that happened around that Palestine area. It was what might be said as war-torn Palestine. Well, you also had to keep in mind that if raiders, armies, militaries, if they came in and they were going to pillage things, if they set fire to things, right, they buried stuff because they also knew that they didn't know what might happen in their world that they lived in that way. So to keep things safe, you buried things. How many can go all the way back to when Joshua was leading the Israelites into right, the promised land? If they were going to have all of these military conquests, one of the things that was said to them was, don't touch the silver and gold. They were allowed to go in and take a lot of things, but there was a man in the military named Achan. And Achan saw some silver when they were going in pillaging, and he took it. And what did he do? He went and he buried it underneath of his tent, right? Because he thought this was valuable to him. Ended up costing him his life, but something that was valuable, he buried it. How many of you are familiar with Matthew chapter 25, the story of the talents, right? There was the man who was given one talent. There was another one that was given five. There was another that was given 10, right? Well, the five and the 10, they invested it, but what did the guy do that only had one? Well, he wasn't quite sure what to do with it. He just knew it was valuable, so he said, I'm just going to bury it. Again, they buried things because it was of value. And this man has found a treasure that has been buried. Could I make the point this morning that if you're looking for a treasure that is buried, you have to be looking. You have to be seeking. There's a trait this morning that says those who are seeking meet the Bible that says seek and you will fine, right? So if you're seeking this morning, God's not going to hide the treasure from you that you won't find it. You will find what God has for you this morning. But guess what the Bible says? 
When you find the kingdom of God, when you find Jesus, the treasure, it produces joy. What does it say? When he found this treasure, what did it say? With excitement, with joy, right? Some of you, would you like to have a little joy in your life? Would you like to have a little bit of excitement in your life? You probably know where I'm going. Some of you walked in here, looked like you've been baptized in vinegar. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> That's my go-to phrase when we talk about that sour look, right? It's just you, right? But some of us, we want that joy. We're t- tired of being discouraged and downcast and dejected. We would love to have a little excitement in our lives. And so when you find the kingdom of God, it should produce joy and excitement. It shouldn't be, oh man, I really got to do that? There should be joy in our life about coming to church. It shouldn't be, oh man, I got to go to church again? Man, can I just pause? Pull your toes back. Pull them back. Get them back if I'm about to step on them, right? The whole heart is wrong. If you feel like you've got to go to church, right? If you feel like you've got to go, it's a heart. That's a flag that says, "Ah, Dusty, you need to check your heart. If you feel like you've got to instead of I get to. I remember David reading the Bible. David said, I rejoiced when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. God wants you to have joy in your life about being a part of the kingdom. When you find Jesus, you can have joy in the midst of of unjoyful times. It's, it's, it's just this counter message that even in some of our difficult moments, God can produce joy. I mean, I've read some stuff in the Bible that really gives me some pause because James said it like this, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, troubles, challenges, difficulties. I question where he was at when he said that because I don't know that I always count it all joy when you fall into various troubles and trials. But then the, the apostle Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 5, right? He said, and not only that, but we can rejoice in troubles and tribulations because it produces something, right? The, the troubles and challenges give me opportunity so something productive can be produced in my life. God will never waste your pain. That's a side note. That one was free, not a part of the notes. Come on, just messing this morning. But imagine the excitement when you find that thing, right? To the one who finds it. Can I just say it like this too? Once you find it, don't lose it. Don't don't give it up. Don't let something come in and take its place, right? Don't let it fade. Don't become numb to it. Right? Allow it to continue to be Jesus at the center. Right? Come on, you with me this morning. Center of it all. I'm not the, I'm not the worship leader. I, gotta, I, I put in the chat the other day, how come I never get asked to, to do any solos? And they say, well, you can. Just sing so low nobody can hear you. <laughs> They're brutal. I mean, they didn't waste I mean, they just like, yep, that's the truth. Go on. Whenever we were planning to plant the church, God gave me this, this, this phrase that I was pitching to pastors as I was trying to raise money to plant this church. And one of the things that I would tell them, I said, what if, what if, say that with me, what if? What if? Now everybody, this side didn't get into it, okay? What if? What if? What if there was a life-changing treasure hidden in your field, but you didn't know it was there, and I did? I suppose two things would happen, right? You would want to know it sooner than later in life. If it was life-changing, you wouldn't want to go your whole life and then discover that all it was right there in front of me, right there, and I didn't even know it was there. Why didn't you tell me about this? How could you know about this treasure if it's going to change my life and you not tell me? Right? If it's a life-changing treasure, what if it was hidden and you didn't know it was there and I did? You would want to know it sooner than later in life. And then what? You'd want me to help you find it. If I knew it was there and you didn't, can I just tell you I was that man? And that's why God called us to Plant Purpose Church. Because 20 years ago, on October the 3rd, 2002, it'll be 21 years this year in October, the police busted in my door with a battering ram and hauled me off to jail. I'd been up for multiple days. I was addicted to methamphetamines. I was dealing, manufacturing. I was dealing about uh, manufacturing five to $15,000 worth of meth a week. I was using about $700 a day. I was broken. I was hopeless. I was empty. I felt like my life had no purpose. And 27 years of my life, I lived not knowing there was a treasure 
It wasn't until somebody came up to the jail cell, and I, and, I didn't even, and I didn't even know anything about this. I just thought that when I was asking this pastor to come up and talk to me, he was going to help me find the ticket to not go to prison because I was facing 40-some years in prison. I had been arrested three times for manufacturing methamphetamines. That's three Class B felonies. I burn up a truck running from the cops one time. I had a class D felony. They dropped the B, gave me a D. I don't know how you go from B to D. That doesn't sound like a good report card. But here I was, 27 years old, not knowing that Jesus was the only way, not knowing that Jesus was the treasure. And so when I would tell these pastors, people need to know about that treasure, and we need your money. <laughs> We ain't got any money and we got to plan a church because people need to know. People need to find my place, my people, my purpose, right? And that's why there's a room filled full of people today. I mean, there ain't very many open seats in here, right? Because God is calling people to discover their God-given purpose through an authentic relationship with him, to discover the center of the kingdom. That's what God's calling us to this morning. So let me compare these little parables this morning. Let me compare this. So as we, we look at the pearl of great price, right, there's something that's interesting here because the pearl talks about there's a merchant who is out and about. He's walking the markets. He's looking at every table. It's like whenever you go to a sports card show or you ever go to any of these big trade shows, right, they got all the tables set out. And if you got a good eye for what you might be looking for, you've trained yourself. You know how to discover the good stuff. Somebody might not even know what they have. You know how to walk up into the garage sale. You know how to get on marketplace. You know how. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking talking about you know how to dig in and see oh i know how to i can look on ebay and see what this stuff's going for right but you can walk up and down the aisles at the card show because that's my language right and you're looking to discover that deal right that's the merchant who's looking for that pearl of great value right he's intentional he's he's seeking it he knows what he's looking for but then there's the guy who found the treasure and he wasn't intentional. He just happened to walk up on it. Like, whoa, here it is, right? You see, some of us are there, though. Like, it all of a sudden walked up on me. I didn't know I, what I was looking for. I just passively happened to be in the right place. I mean, jail was a good place to get my attention. <laughs> but, but come on, he stumbled upon it in a sense. Some of you might have been in that place where somebody invited you to church. You, you weren't really looking for what they were going to be talking about that day. And then all of a sudden that preacher gets up and it's like he's read your mail. And you're elbowing your, your friend there saying, did you tell them about me? Did you tell them what I've been? Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you wonder if I've been scrolling your Facebook status, seeing what you've been dealing with. Or somebody, you know, did your mom message me or something? You know, you're wondering. You want to go check my PMs. But I'm with you. I understand what you're talking about this morning. Because I just stumbled upon it. And I'm like, man, he's talking to me about where I'm at in life. And I'm like, absolutely. I'm empty. I'm void. I want to know if I have purpose. Because I felt like my life didn't have purpose anymore. I'm thinking I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. Right? The rest of any of whatever might have been in my mind when I was younger, thinking those would be my best years. Right? That's what I was thinking. But I want to tell you this morning as we compare these two, the one that was passively and the one that was intentionally seeking this morning, that everything you're looking for, everything you're not even knowing what to look for is found in Jesus this morning. It's found in Jesus this morning. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3 say this. In him, well, let's read it out loud this morning. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How much? All. You know in the Greek when it says all, you know what it means? You guys are Greek scholars. Man, it means everything, right? In him lie hidden all the treasures. Right? That, that word just jumps out at me because, you know, we're obviously talking about treasure this morning. We're talking about something that's priceless, but catch it, in him lie hidden. It's there to be discovered, 
but you need to seek it out. And you're without excuse this morning because you've already heard that you need to start seeking. You've already heard that you know what the treasure is. It's Jesus. You've already heard this morning that in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Right? You want to know God? It's in Jesus. You want wisdom? You, you want to be the foolish person that confounds the wise? Hidden in Jesus. It's, it's right there in Jesus. Catch this now. Both parables tell us that once they found the treasure, they sold everything. It's, it's in both of them. That's something significant because as you begin to understand a principle of the kingdom, living in the kingdom means putting everything else second and the most important thing is Jesus and he is at the center of it all. But some of us, we struggle with it. We struggle with it and that's real. It's a, it's a real, real struggle. I know, the struggle is real. Because we haven't yet fully understood the value of the kingdom. We haven't fully understand or understood the value of who Jesus is. And so in order for us to sell everything, we need to recognize that the thing that I'm selling everything for is more valuable than everything that I'm selling. You with me this morning? You understand what I'm saying? So we've, have you ever heard the phrase, one man's garbage is another man's treasure? Right? Different things have different values to people. But then there's some things that just have universal value. But then there's things that might have universal value, but I don't care how much money you give me. I'm not getting up, giving up my kids. I'm not giving up my wife. Like, I don't care if you, you, you bring in the stadium full of gold. I'm not giving you my kid, right? I'm not giving you my life for it. So as we, we begin to look at this and remind ourselves, you know, not everything is for sale. The Mona Lisa is not for sale, right? The kingdom is not for sale. Your soul is not for sale. Jesus is not for sale. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he what? If he gained the whole world but lose his soul, right? So here we are comparing and contrasting soul and the world, right? The world is not worth as much as your soul. One soul, right? Your soul matters, so what does a man gain if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? You've lost everything. You've lost everything. So we have to understand the value of our soul. We have to understand the value of the kingdom so that you're willing to say, hey, I'll sell everything to get this one thing. So in order to do so, you're going to need to prioritize what matters. You need to stop, pause, think about what matters most to you. What matters most? Is the treasure of the kingdom what matters most to us? Right? And as we begin to prioritize what matters most, there's three things that I always say are time, treasure, and talent. If something matters, you'll put time into it. If something matters, you'll put your treasures, your money into it. Right? If something matters, you'll put your talents into it, your gifts into it. If it really matters to you, you'll make time for it. Come on. Toes back. Ready for this one, right? Because some of us have prioritized some things by our lifestyle. Our words are saying it matters to me, but my lifestyle is saying another thing, right? You say your wife and your kids, I'm picking on men because I'm one this morning. We say how, 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 uh, how important they are to us, but they're getting the leftovers. They're getting the leftovers of your life, Right? You're not prioritizing your family. We are not prioritizing those things. Because if they matter to me, I prioritize them. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm still meddling, still keep the feedback, right? If, if church matters to us, we prioritize church. If Jesus matters to us, we prioritize Jesus. We prioritize it. And how do we prioritize it? With our time. Time is one of the most valuable things that we have right? And then we prioritize it with our treasure, right? That's our finances. There are things that matter to us, and I demonstrate it, right? That is a kingdom principle of, of, of treasures given, right? Treasures received, treasures given, and so we do it that way. So if it matters, you're going you're gonna to put these things forth, forth. But here's the tension where the struggle gets real. There's a teaching in the Bible where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, 
And here we are. He's young. He's rich. Probably handsome. He's probably got all of those, those things in an earthly sense going for him. He's got money. He's got power. He's got status. He's probably that guy, right? And he comes to Jesus. He wants to get to Jesus because he's been thinking about some stuff. And he's really trying to affirm what he really already hopes that he's right about, right? That's why I don't preach politics around here because usually when you want me, you, let, me let me rephrase that, right? The reason why I don't preach politics is because if I happen to be at another church, they would want me to preach and affirm what they already believe, right? That's usually how that goes. It got quiet like I was going to say something crazy in here. <laughs> what I'm saying is that often you just want somebody to say what you believe and think so you can be like, well, my pastor says that. My pastor says it like that, right? But the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, what do you think? He said, well, honor your father and mother. Basically, keep the law, right? And he's like, yes. And then Jesus says to him, but hey, you got all that right. That's good. But now go and sell everything you got. Go give it to the poor. And he said, then you start to understand the kingdom. And you know what happened? The rich young lord, he walked away dejected because he valued things more than he valued Jesus. And I'm afraid some of us can value things more than we value Jesus. And that's our tension. It's our tension. And we wrestle with that. And, and things can mean more than they should. And here's what happens when we get into that way of thinking is that our choices are always guided by what matters most to us. There's, there's like this underwritten rule. Your choices are going to reveal your heart. <clears throat> the same way that Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your choices really tell on you. They really do. Because if I tell my wife she's most important to me, but I make choices that demonstrate that she's not most important to me, then there's a disconnect somewhere. <clears throat> but Jesus is calling us, though, to sell out. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. If the rich young ruler could have just understood, seek first the kingdom of God. All of those things that you really want, if you'll just get the priority right and keep the main thing the plain thing. Come on, somebody. If you'll just get it right and put the kingdom first, God's going to provide everything that you need because he's Jehovah Jireh. Because he's my provider. And as a father knows how to give gifts to his son, so our heavenly father knows how to give the best good gifts to us. Ah, uh, pastor, what you talking about? Well, read James. Every good gift and every perfect gift, James 1.17, comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's what the Bible says. When you seek first the kingdom of God and prioritize the kingdom, and I live all in, right? The Bible says in Luke 9, 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's all in with Jesus. It's all, in, but we self-sabotage because we're in this tension. But can I just shift gears a little bit? And now I want to flip the parable. See, in the parable, it's got the merchant, it's got the, the treasure finder, I'm not going to call him Hunter because he finds this treasure. He passively comes up and he finds this treasure of the kingdom. But now I want to flip it. Now I want to flip it and I want to make Jesus the one searching. Come on. I want to make Jesus the one who's now looking, right? Because what if we begin to see that he's the one that sought you? Come on. Luke chapter 15, right? There's the one that has the one lost sheep. Would he not leave the 99 to go find the one? What about the woman who had 10 coins and she lost one silver coin? Would she not forget about the 10 so she can go find the one? And then what about the prodigal, right? Would the father not rejoice when the one comes back? He sought us. Can I tell somebody this morning, you were to die for. You were so good, so valuable that Jesus would give everything this morning so that he could have you. He would be willing to be brutally beaten, mocked, rejected, betrayed, all of the things that Jesus did. Come on, you got to get it this morning. Because if you don't know how valuable you are to Jesus, you'll never have a value for him that equally aligns. Come on, somebody, this morning. He sought you. 
He paid the highest price to get his treasure. I'm going to say it again. He paid the highest price to get his treasure. Uh, is that really biblical? Romans chapter 5, verse 8 said, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for you. He paid the price so he could have access to you and get his treasure. Get his treasure. I want to invite our worship team to join me on the platform. So I want to ask you, what's Jesus worth to you? What is Jesus worth? worth to you. I don't know if you can remember this or if you've ever been in a place like this, but if you can maybe dream with me, daydream with me, remember what it might have been like falling in love for the first time. Might have, maybe, maybe you've never fallen in love, maybe you have, maybe, maybe, I don't know where you're at with all that, but maybe you can remember moments. I don't even know how far it goes back for everybody. But I can remember uh, when Chantal and I first started talking, we went through this phase, you have long phone calls, right? Nowadays, it might be long text messages. <laughs> I can remember, uh, oh, geez, we emailed back and forth at one particular point, like, who emails their girlfriend, right? <laughs> Early morning text, right? Good morning, babe. We didn't have emojis when the first cell phones first came out. I'm a little old for that, right? Can't wait to see you again, right? You're longing to see that person again. Chantal hated the phone early on because it always made her head hot and she never really wanted, but she would endure so she could spend time talking to her mans. <laughs> that's, that's her nickname for me, I'm her mans. But I want you to think about it this morning in relationship to what Jesus worth to us. Do we long for that relationship like just sitting at his feet? Now, I know, men, this can be challenging. I'm, I'm real re real when it comes to uh, men having a relationship with God because there's things about relationship with God that might be easier for a female to understand than a man to understand, right? Falling in love with God, falling in love with Jesus, that language can trip us up sometimes. So when I use words like just sitting at his feet, like, you're like, I don't know, go sit at his feet? Like, what are you talking about? Like, do I really want to go sit at, like, but it, it, metaphorically speaking, what I'm talking about, you just want to go spend time with God. Like, you might, without being irreverent, blasphemous, like, you just, man, I just need to go talk to my buddy. In a godly, reverent kind of, I need to go talk to my buddy kind of way. Superior, I got to get to this guy. Holy, reverent kind of buddy stuff is what I'm talking about, if you're with me. I just want to know more about this God. See, I can connect with that as a man. I want to know more about God. I want to, I want to know more about how to be a godly man. I want to know more about what, that, what that's like. I want, to, I want to know how to overcome some of the things I deal with as a man. Women, same with you. You, you want to know more about this person. You know, as I can relate the principle of, like, getting to know my wife, Right? There's this, this draw to you want to spend time together. You want to listen together. See, once you know your worth to Jesus, then you begin to know what Jesus is worth to you. But I can say it to you like this. If you thought you weren't everything to him, you're not really going to feel like he's everything to you. If you didn't think that Jesus wholly cared for you, you're probably not going to wholly care for him. If you didn't think that Jesus forgives your sins, you're probably not going to seek to be forgiven. You with me? Is that making sense this morning? If you thought he didn't love you, then you're not going to love back. But this morning, you're the treasure for this side of the story as I'm flipping the parable and using the biblical language that he came for you. Jesus came for you this morning. I know I'm, I'm bending the parable a little bit. I'm just bending it a little bit to try to make a point here. But it is a biblical message that Jesus sought us. That's a biblical message. There's no misunderstanding of scripture there. So this is your chance to respond. I wanna ask you to stand to your feet this morning.
We do this every Sunday. We give you a chance to respond to the message. It's not just knowledge. It's got to be practical. Theology is not just about knowing more, putting more in our head. It's about life change. And so I want to know, how have you responded to this treasure? I want you to think about that. How have you responded? Is it possible maybe that some of us maybe have discovered that treasure, but we went and buried it, and we were going to go sell everything, but somewhere along the way, we got a little distracted? Somewhere along the way, we, 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 we wanted it, we found it, we buried it, but on the way to go sell everything, we just got distracted. We never went back and got it. Maybe we just kind of let go of it. Something else maybe caught our eye. Something else caught our attention. Something else take its place. Has the kingdom lost its value? Has Jesus lost his value? If you fit anywhere in all that this morning, I just want to encourage you. This is that moment to say, okay, I, I want to sell everything out this morning. I want to be all in for Jesus. If you're here this morning, you need to invite Jesus into your life. This is the moment you do that. I don't give you some special prayer. I ask you to start that conversation between you and Jesus yourself. You got to start to learn how to pray on your own. But I tell you what you want to do is you want to be real with God. You want to let him know where you're at. Sometimes it's like, man, I haven't talked to you. I, I haven't even thought about you. But this morning, I'm going to ask you to forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for not taking this thing seriously. Forgive me for getting distracted, whatever it might be. But if you speak from your heart, Jesus is going to hear you this morning. I assure you of that. He is ready. He's ready this morning, church. Thank you for watching Purpose Church YouTube channel. Before you go, would you hit the like and subscribe button to stay up on what's happening at Purpose Church? And make sure to share today's message with your friends and your family. If you'd like to support the ministries of Purpose Church, you can click the link in the comment section. And make sure to join us live on Sundays at 1030 a.m.